So as we start out to clear, get our minds back on the game, I'm going to ask you to evaluate this system that we have up here, okay? So reviewing, here we have arterial A with a pressure of 90 on one end, 40 on the other, a radius of 0.025. And for arterial B, we've got the same pressures, but we have an internal radius of 0.005. Put up the question for voting between arterial A and B. What's up? Okay. <laughs> All right. Even if you don't want to vote on the screen, hopefully everybody has their votes together. Okay. Last two. Okay. Great. So we're almost all on the same page. And you might imagine, the reason we have this question up here is this is an important topic for this unit, right? Okay. So when we're comparing these flows, okay, what we were thinking about was our flow equation. So our flow is a difference in pressure, same between both of these arterials, so we don't have to pay attention to it right now, over the resistance, right? So we're trying to figure out which of these two has lower versus higher resistance, right? Because a higher resistance is going to give us a lower flow rate, oh, or rephrasing, I guess we ask for greater flow. So less resistance gives us greater flow. Okay. So we're not done because what we have is not big R resistance, we've got little r radius, right? So we know that resistance is inversely proportional to radius, basically, right? So we don't need exact numbers, but we know that things with a greater radius have less resistance. Things with a smaller radius have more resistance. So arterial A with its larger radius, right, bigger little r, means it has a small resistance, so smaller big R, and then we do it again, we flip that into our flow equation. So we know that that lesser resistance gives us greater flow. So being able to understand changes in resistance due to changes in those factors that affect resistance, which most of the time is going to be radius in this unit, um, it's gonna be important as we start to talk about controlling blood flow to organs, as we start to talk about what's going on in arterials and changes in our overall resistance and therefore our overall flow and pressure in our cardiovascular system. Right. 
The other thing we did at the end of class was thinking about blood pressures. So I got one that should actually work this time. All right, so we're gonna listen to another blood pressure practice. Remembering that what we're listening for is the difference between our systolic and diastolic pressures. So we're going to ignore sounds that are someone like subtly breathing or accidentally moving their arm, but to find that systolic pressure, that's a higher pressure because it happens when the heart contracts. So we've got lots of blood, lots of pressure in the arteries. Diastolic pressure is going to be the lower one. So diastolic pressure uh, is going to be marked as an absence of noise, right? So when we stop hearing what sounds like the heartbeat, right? That's when we're at the diastolic pressure because that lack of noise means that the blood is just flowing constantly, smoothly, interrupted by nothing. So there's nothing to hear anymore. So I'll play this example and we'll take a, a little look. So we have cut off arterial flow, We're waiting for it to come back. You have to do this in the future. There are lots of examples on YouTube. But let's put in our books. So number three was what we just listened to. So approximately what blood pressure do we think we heard? I'm sorry, these are sometimes hard to scan. We used to make people buy eye clickers, but I don't like making you guys spend money if I don't have to, which is why we're doing this. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. Um, so the official answer is this 94 over 62. So I agree we did start to hear some noise at the beginning there at those higher pressures, but we weren't consistently hearing it. So it was probably due to someone kind of shifting around a little bit. We'd be able to tell a little bit better if we could actually see them. But around 94 on that stigma manometer was when we started to consistently hear that really loud thumping, the boom, boom, boom. They kept going as opposed to just like a little bit of noise. Um, so that higher number, right, was when we started to consistently hear the systolic pressure, right, systolic. Overcoming that pressure in the cuff. And then the lower number, right, is the diastolic pressure. So when that pressure in the artery, even when the heart is relaxed, is still above the pressure in the cuff. We've got our diastolic. I will be not be testing you on whether you can hear these sounds uh, to match the official pressures, but we do want to understand like why this works. Right, that's that's what we want to understand here is that that relationship between the pressure in the artery and why that means you can actually test something, why that means you can hear it. In the future, someone probably will quiz you on being able to take these right. It's just not going to be me. <laughs> okay. So, moving on to our next group of blood vessels. Okay. So, last time we talked about our big arteries, right? So, they have 
thick walls. They've got lots of connective tissue in those thick walls. Those thick walls mean that they hold a lot of pressure. And you think about them as being kind of a pressure reservoir, which is great because we need that pressure in the arteries to drive blood flow throughout our systemic circuit. Next down, we get to our arterioles. So our arterioles are smaller than arteries, but they're still going out to organs, to your systems, okay? And this is where we're primarily going to see changes in resistance, which is why that was our, our warm up question, right? So our arterioles are where we see lots of resistance and where we're gonna see that we can kind of control resistance, okay? They're part of what we call the microcirculation, so you won't see them in lab, but they're really important. And they're going to connect those arteries to the capillary beds where we'll see exchange of gases, nutrients, wastes, between the blood and the tissue. Um, and there are also things called meta-arterials, which are gonna have kind of a shape. We'll talk about them when we see them. Yep. So arterials can control resistance, right? They can become more or less resistant, therefore reflecting low pressure because they have rings of smooth muscle, right? So in the walls of the arterials, we have smooth muscle. We actually even saw in that chart at the beginning um, they have some connections to your nervous system, okay? And that's going to be important as we start to talk about regulation. The smooth muscle, right, because it's a ring, right, if a ring of muscle contracts, right, this is basically a sphincter, right, if a ring of muscle contracts, you get something smaller, right? Yes, <laughs> right, got a larger ring, smaller ring. So we can decrease the radius, and when we decrease the radius, we can therefore increase our resistance. If we relax, that radius would get bigger, decreasing the resistance. Okay, so these arterioles are providing our greatest resistance to blood flow in the system. Uh, so you can see that while, while we're in the arteries, if we're looking at the pressure, we can see that oscillation between our systolic pressure up high, diastolic pressure down low, Right, uh, And we know that when we calculate our mean arterial pressure, we have to kind of double weight that diastolic pressure, creating our weighted average. And we'll review that when we get back to regulation of our blood pressure. Okay. But from the arteries, where we don't see much of a uh, drop in pressure, right, we do start to see a drop in the arterioles. Okay. So this drop here, and the pressure is paired with a, an increase in resistance, not on this chart, okay? But our arterioles are gonna be responsible for more than half of our total peripheral resistance, All right? So more than 60%, actually, right? more than one. So they're quite resistant and we can regulate their resistance. So here we see a picture of some different arterioles, which would have different resistance because of their different radii, right? So how fat basically our arterial is, is dependent on the state of that smooth muscle in the wall. So we can see the smooth muscle in the picture in that kind of central layer, right? We have an endothelial layer of cells right here in the middle that would be touching the blood. Then we have our smooth muscle layer. Here we see our muscle cells. And then we have that connective tissue layer on the outside. So a feature of smooth muscle in particular is that it has something called tone, right? So tone. Now, what tone means is that it's actually kind of in the middle. At, it, at its natural resting state, right? So it's not super contracted tight together, but it's also not like all the way relaxed. So articular tone means that at rest, we're, we're at a state where we could dilate, right? We could make that arterial or radius bigger, therefore decreasing its resistance, increasing flow. 
Or we could contract more, it's a constriction, make that radius smaller, increasing resistance, and therefore decreasing the flow. Okay. So that tone isn't dependent on any extrinsic influences. You don't need a nerve coming in to tell smooth muscle to have tone. It just does. It, it has tone to start out with. We will see that the nervous system can change the state of that smooth muscle, but we don't need it for this baseline. So definitions again that we saw before. Vasoconstriction, right, is constricting like a boa constrictor, our blood vessel. That's where the vaso is from. So vasoconstriction for an arterial would mean we're contracting that smooth muscle, which acts kind of like a sphincter. So it's getting smaller, decreasing the radius, raising resistance. Vasodilation is going to be the opposite. So vasodilation, we're starting at rest with this arterial tone, not all the way out as big and loose as we could get. So when we have vasodilation, we uncontract, we dilate, just like you could dilate a pupil, right? So we dilate that vessel, making it bigger, increasing the radius, decreasing the resistance, increasing flow. This is super helpful that we can do this and we can make these changes because this is going to allow us to control where the blood flow goes. We've got lots and lots of arterioles and they don't all contract at the same time. They don't all dilate at the same time. You're going to be able to get certain little groups of them and have a local reaction to something, right? And the blood cell has to go somewhere. So if one little group of arterioles clamps down, constricts, that means all that blood, it's not going to be flowing to that capillary bed or that organ attached to those arterioles. It's going to get shunted away to some other part of the body, right? So this is how we can give different amounts of blood flow to different capillary beds, which looking bigger means we're going to get different amounts of blood flow to different organs, right? So like when you're digesting, you might want lots of blood pooling to your gastrointestinal tract. But when you're out running, you want lots of blood going to the muscles, right? And we can change that by changing things like arterial or radius. We are also going to see that in terms of like homeostasis, we also use arterial or radius and therefore resistance to help us regulate the blood pressure. So regulate mean arterial pressure due to that relationship between resistance, flow, and pressure that we'll get back to. So we're controlling blood flow distribution to organs by controlling um, that blood flow coming from the arter arteries to the arterioles and then to capillary beds in each organ. Okay. And the blood flow going to different organs is really based on do those organs need more blood, right? right? So part of this is based on their need. Okay. So we can vary how much blood is going to those organs by varying their resistance. And we're gonna see in a second, part of like how exactly that works. Like how does your body know that some tissue needs more blood flow? Another thing that is true, right? Is that we can make another sort of permutation on that flow equation, right? So flow overall was a difference in pressure over resistance. So we did this with cardiac output before, right? So we had cardiac output for flow, mean arterial pressure for pressure, resistance as TPR. If we wanted to look for a specific organ, we could just reshape it that way, right? Our organ flow. Our difference in pressure, still going to be our mean arterial pressure because that's still what's coming up to the arterioles in that organ, right? So that's still going to stand in for our pressure gradient, is that blood pressure. Okay. But then we could be specific and have the organ resistance specifically in those beds in the organ rather than our total peripheral resistance, right? So organ flow, organ resistance. So it just works the same way as our larger equation did. So this is useful because 
we know that we have in our systemic circuit parallel flow, right? So when we were talking about how blood flows in our last unit of last semester, we talked about how we had series flow between the lungs and the systemic circuit. So that pulmonary circuit, we had to go through it first. Then we go to the systemic circuit second. So that was our series flow. But when we're thinking about organs, that's not what's happening. You don't have to go to organ A, then organ B, then organ C, which is great because it means you don't have like dropping oxygen concentrations as you get closer and closer to your feet or something like that. That would be inconvenient. We've got this parallel flow. We're splitting out, going to each of our organs at the same time in parallel, right? So we've got those parallel lines to each other. So what we then have happen when we're changing our arteriolar radius to get that different distribution to different systems, we can think about how much blood we're starting out with. Right? So in this example, we're starting out with organ A or little tube A here, getting about 50% of our cardiac output. Our total cardiac output is about three liters per minute. So it's got 1.5. B is our next widest, right? So we can see in the picture that we have different diameters, different radii for each of these tubes, right? So B's next, it's got 33%, C, 17%. Next, we're gonna make a change. So what we have happen here is that B has contracted down, right? So we've got vasoconstriction going on here in the center. Okay. So one thing that happened is our cardiac output and our total flow at this point in time at first changes, right? And that's because to get total peripheral resistance or whole resistance in the system, we had to add these together, right? But as we see the percentage of that blood flow dropping for B as its radius gets smaller here in the center, we can see that proportionally, even though this is dropping here, A and C now have more of the percent of that cardiac output than they did before. This is a, the kind of thing that you can see kind of happening in the body as we change radii of arterioles in different organs. So now we're going to think about the factors that might have this effect. So we're going to have both like local factors, intrinsic factors, and we're also going to have extrinsic factors. So remember, when we're thinking about intrinsic control, intrinsic factors, we're thinking about stuff that's right there due to the properties of like the vessel and the surrounding tissue that we're thinking about. When we think about extrinsic factors, we're thinking about reactions to things like hormones everywhere or nerves coming from your spinal column or from your brain, things like that, right? So intrinsic control is due really to things happening right around the arterial itself, not from control out in the distance involving a different organ system. So for our local factors, that are controlling the resistance in our arterioles. What we're going to be doing is we're gonna be changing the contractile state of the smooth muscle, right? We can vasoconstrict, so clamping down. We can vasodilate, increasing that radius. And some of the ways we can do that have to do with signaling from other places, those extrinsic factors, but some things happen right there at the exact point in the arterial that we're concentrating on. So we can make some generalizations before we get into the specific steps. So a lot of this control of the arterial fluid radius has to do with that idea that like we want more blood flow going to organs that need blood flow right at that moment, right? Now, an organ needs blood flow, one of the, the reasons that we might need more blood flow is that we're using a lot of energy 
right? That tissue is active, it's doing something, you're digesting, or your skeletal muscle is out there contracting, running, you're doing something that requires energy, which means that those cells, right, are going to be metabolically active, right? So they're going to be uh, doing glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, they're producing ATP because they need it to do their function. So a lot of this regulation is going to be happening in response to a change in metabolic activity resulting in changes to blood flow, at least the first things that we're talking about at this local level. So in general, you increase the activity of some tissue, right? Like it's working harder, therefore needs more energy. Metabolism is going, 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 going rapidly, right? They're gonna want more blood. And if they're doing stuff, they want more blood because they want that oxygen that we need for oxidative phosphorylation, producing lots of carbon dioxide, our waste product of breaking down glucose. And we wanna get rid of that because in some ways it acts as kind of like a poison in your body. So we're gonna have increased blood flow and vasodilation to organ systems that are active. Um, and then places where we have lower levels of metabolic activity, if they're not working, are generally going to see some vasoconstriction because they don't need as much blood flow. So we're gonna kind of cut it up. So we're going to see that we have some markers uh, for these changes in metabolic activity. Um, so when we're looking at increased metabolic activity, first bullet point is in fact probably the most important, right? We're gonna to start to see more carbon dioxide, that waste product. Um, we'll also see changes to potassium and hydrogen ions kind of along the way. When we see decreases in metabolic activity, we're gonna see kind of like more oxygen, less carbon dioxide. What we're about to focus on is really gonna be that ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen. So that's important for your blood. And makes sense when we're thinking about metabolic activity. We understand how both of those things are involved with these metabolic processes. So we're gonna step through a phenomenon called active hyperemia first. Okay. So to remember things, I find it easier to break down words, right? So active, this is referring to that metabolic activity here, right? Activity is the metabolic activity in this case. Hyper means more, right? So hyper, more of this stuff. Emia, anytime you see this emia ending, this usually has something to do with the blood, right? So like anemia has to do with like low iron in your blood, right? Emia is usually indicative of some blood-related condition, right? So this, in full, if we kind of break it out, right? We're saying that we have hyperemia, so more blood flow in response to this active piece, metabolic activity, right? Which is in the definition in red, right? So increased blood flow in response to those increases in metabolic activity. This first slide is really just a summary of everything that's happening. And we are gonna walk through the figure uh, that kind of explains this. But our baseline state is gonna be that we have a steady rate at which your tissue is using oxygen and that it's producing carbon dioxide to be removed. So if we're at our baseline, we're gonna see no like extra buildup of either oxygen or carbon dioxide because we're getting the right amount of oxygen. It's being delivered at the rate that that tissue needs it, that it's being consumed. And that blood flow is going at the right rate for all the carbon dioxide to get in. So everything's when we increase our metabolic rate, and so we're trying to make more ATP to do some type of process. This means that all of a sudden we have a greater oxygen need because cellular respiration metabolism requires oxygen as that final electron acceptor from the electron transport chain. Right, we need oxygen to be efficient at producing lots of ATP. 
So when we have an increase in metabolic rate, that oxygen is being used up faster and faster and faster, faster than we're actually getting oxygen to that tissue. And carbon dioxide is our byproduct of metabolism. So we're producing more and more and more carbon dioxide. And that blood is not flowing fast enough to drag it all away. Your body does not like this, right? It wants that tissue to have enough oxygen. It does not want carbon dioxide building up in different parts of your body. So a response to the situation where we don't have enough oxygen and have low O2, and we have too much carbon dioxide and just build up a high CO2 is going to be vasodilation because vasodilation means we're increasing the radius of that arterial, right? We increase the radius, which means we decrease the resistance, which means we increase the blood flow, right? So it's all just like step by step by step. So as we increase the radius of that arterial, we've returned more blood flow to that region of the body. We increase this blood flow, it means we're bringing more oxygen, right? That's what we wanted. We're feeding that metabolic, that metabolically active tissue more oxygen because it's metabolically active. And because we have more blood flow, we can take away more CO2. So we're basically kind of erasing this buildup and this disturbance to the balance of oxygen and CO2 here. So now we picture four. So this is the figure uh, I was asking you to look at. Okay, so here we see our steady state conditions. All right, so what we're looking at, we've got blood flow going into our arterial, eventually going to this capillary bed is where the actual exchange would be happening. Um, would be in the capillary bed. Here we have our extracellular fluid, um, and specifically here, this kind of looks like interstitial fluid between the tissues. Okay. And we've got our oxygen being used at the same rate that we're delivering it, right? So we've got two oxygen coming out of the blood here we're pulling two oxygen into the cells on the other side. The same thing is happening with our carbon dioxide, right? So over here, our cells produced two carbon dioxide, okay? And those two carbon dioxide go into the blood in the cup. Okay. So this is what we like. We're using and producing things at the same rate. Okay. So next what happens, those cells are metabolically active. They're making lots of ATP because they're trying to do something. Okay. And now we can see that they're sucking in tons of oxygen. All right, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, we pulled in these nine little oxygens in this example. And we're also producing more carbon dioxide than we were too. All right, so now we got one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So before we have this intrinsic regulation of blood flow, before we have this local control, we're not in balance anymore, right? Because we're still just getting rid of two carbon dioxide going into the blood in the capillaries. And we're still only delivering two oxygens. So we're not happy at this point as that tissue is becoming metabolic. Okay, so next, I want you to predict what are some things that are happening kind of all at once here. So we're gonna imagine that we're on a run and the tissue that we're talking about is some oxidative fibers in your lower limb. You know that those muscles produce ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. So they're rapidly using up oxygen. And in this case, we're starting to get, oops, should have written extracellular. Well, it would be both intra and extracellular in this case, but we're gonna go with that extracellular fluid. So extracellular fluid, I say it would be both because they're at equilibrium. Um, so the extracellular fluid is beginning to drop. So what else is going to be happening? Let's, let's change all of those to make life easier. 
and to make it match the picture, more importantly. So several of these are going to be correct. So you can choose multiple things if you want. All right, take another couple seconds if you're going to vote. And then we'll group. So more than half of you picked each of these things that happens to be true. So let's talk through those. Okay, so this is a description of a case in which we would have this active hyperemia happen. Right? So this is just an example of a literal situation where this phenomenon would occur. Okay. So we know we've got metabolically active tissue, right? Metabolically active because it's producing ATP. And we have that O2 level dropping because we're using up lots of oxygen to produce that energy. Oxygen gets there with the blood, so we know we need to vasodilate so that we can get more blood flow, right? So vasodilation, increasing the radius of a blood vessel so that we can have lower resistance and therefore more blood flow, okay? So those two things are paired together. Now, this is only talking about that oxygen side, that drop in oxygen. So this next bit, it's just true because this is the core thing, right? So if oxygen in that fluid is dropping because it's getting used, at the other end of metabolism, we're also producing more carbon dioxide. So either of these would be a marker of the same situation, right? But both of these happen at the same time, drop in oxygen, increase in CO2. Those always kind of go together. Okay. So carbon dioxide decreasing would happen when the tissue is kind of going back to rest and not doing as much metabolism. And that's when we might want to constrict that blood vessel down, dropping blood flow, because we don't need all that movement of carbon dioxide anymore. We don't need to deliver as much oxygen. So these three would be the opposite situation, basically. So what I was having you do was predict, right? So we were stepping through active hyperemia, okay? We were looking at how that tissue has a greater need for oxygen and is producing too much carbon dioxide, right? So these are our triggers for vasodilation in active hyperemia. So directly, these changes in the gases that are building up in the fluid next to our capillaries and our arterioles, right? We can see the distribution of these colors has changed, right? We have very few blue circles, which are our oxygen, blue or purple, I don't, I don't really know the colors. We've got lots of green, which is our carbon dioxide, right? So that distribution of gases directly, locally, has an effect on the arterioles. That effect is vasodilation in order to increase our blood flow. Questions about this scenario before we move forward? All right. 
So to fix this is what we're looking at now. We're trying to go back to that study state. So you can see that we have now increased the size of that arterial, which means we've increased blood flow. So now we're delivering lots of tasty, tasty oxygen, which is what our tissue wanted. So this is how we return ourselves to that steady state where we're supplying as much oxygen as that tissue is using, and we're taking away as much carbon dioxide as it's producing. So this is the big picture that you can find in your book. And we just step through each little pan. Okay. That was active hydrogen, yes. Okay. Active metabolic activity from the tissue. That's where we got that. We can also have an analogous situation called reactive hyperemia. So we've still got that hyper more. We've still got emia blood. So we know this is still going to be an increase in blood flow. Okay. So the difference here is that instead of active, we have reactive. What that is telling us there, what that's a hint about, is that this is a reaction to something. So reactive hyperemia actually are a reaction to blockages, right? So if you have like a clot that's cutting off the blood flow to some organ, right? Cutting off an arterial, cutting off a capillary bed, right? That blockage, when we don't have blood flow going to that tissue, is going to have the same local effect as the increase in metabolic activity does. So we don't have pictures for this, but I wanna think about it. So maybe I'll do a little drawing, right? So here's gonna be my cells up at the top. Got that little gap where we'll have some fluid. And here's gonna be my blood flow going by. Okay. So if we have a block for our blood flow to that tissue, right? So I got a big clot blocking stuff off here, right? Now, even though that tissue might not be working super hard, your body needs energy all the time, right? So it is still pulling in some oxygen, right? And it's still giving off some carbon dioxide, right? That happens kind of no matter what, right? So we still have some amount of metabolic activity, even if it might be minimal. But now we have no blood flow, right? Because we've got this blockage. So that means that from your arterial's perspective, this is gonna create the same kind of situation as really active, metabolically active tissue did, right? Which is to say, we're still gonna be running out of oxygen because we're still using it. And we're gonna be seeing a buildup of carbon dioxide because we're producing it. But if there's no blood going by that cell, that carbon dioxide is just gonna build up and build up and build up because there's no blood to take it away. So from the perspective of your arterial, it actually doesn't care, it doesn't know why those changes are happening. It just sees that we've got this same situation of not enough oxygen, too much carbon dioxide, okay? So we have the same exact reaction, reactive, so a reactive hyperunia situation, gonna be a reaction to that blockage of blood flow, and the result is the same. You're gonna have vasodilation occur as your body is trying to get more blood there, right? It's trying to get that blood there because there's this clot, right? But it doesn't know that it might be hopeless. So it's trying to increase blood flow because it's seeing that these gases are not appropriately distributed. Okay. That means that when the blockage finally gets released, right? If you have this blood vessel, next to that tissue getting wider and wider and wider because it's trying to take on more and more and more blood flow, right? If we can then get rid of that clot, right? So it's not a clot, say like you're having surgery and like literally clamped it down to cut off blood flow, right? If you can release 
that blockage, you're suddenly gonna have a rush of lots of blood. So you'll have an increase in blood flow due to that low resistance from the vasodilation, which is gonna fix stuff once we have blood flow returned. So that's the difference between the two. The difference is really just the cause of this hyperemia, right? Otherwise, all the oxygen, carbon dioxide stuff works exactly the same. So here we can just see a flow chart from your book showing what we just talked through in a different way, right? So a different way for us to structure this information. So we're looking at a description of active hyperemia. So you can see that what's happening at the tissue rate, kind of our trigger, is that increase in metabolism which means that we're increasing our use of oxygen and we're increasing our production of carbon dioxide, which means that surrounding that tissue, we've now got low oxygen and we now have high carbon dioxide. Okay. I'm just labeling those arrows, right? You've got those arrows in your book too. Okay, All right, so this is the situation that your arterioles are seeing and that that smooth muscle is reacting to in this intrinsic control of blood flow, right? So the reaction to this low oxygen concentration and high carbon dioxide is that we dilate. So we increase the radius. Vasodilation always causes this decrease in resistance because we've got this nice big tube not blocking the flow very much, which means we got more blood flow, which means now we're fixing the situation. Right, so we were using lots of oxygen and had a drop in local oxygen concentrations. Now we're increasing how much oxygen we're delivering. Right, so we're fixing it. And we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide we're removing as we've got that rush of blood going fast. Okay, so the end result is that it gets us back towards our steady state. So we're pulling that oxygen concentration back up, dropping that CO2 concentration down. Once we're back at the steady state, we say this is negative feedback because if we're back at the steady state, we can cross all of this out. We're done because we've corrected the problem. And similarly, you got the same exact thing happening in your book for reactive hyperemia. The only difference is that that concentration change is due to a decrease in blood flow in the first place due to a blockage, or maybe you're bleeding out somewhere else, right? And you have low blood flow for that reason, right? But the same reaction happens in your body. So we'll stop there. Uh -huh. We got one more local intrinsic thing to go through. I'm looking for my slide about what we're doing. Um, ah, there we go. All right, so for next time, Finish reading that section on control of the arterioles and resistance. And I have a, a question I want you to at least start trying to answer for yourselves. Mm -hmm.